I teach foreign policy of Russia and Central Asian states, but I do s some work on Northeast and on politics of UP. Uh, my Naga work mainly is because of CSH, uh, with, whom, uh, with which I was associated 15 years back. It's a work in progress. I have published something, couldn't publish most of it. Uh, asymmetric federalism has been defined, so I won't. Uh, I'll just read out certain definitions which are relevant uh, in order to not to deviate and to be more precise. One is national minorities, a term which has been used many times. National minorities are those uh, which ask for better representation, special powers, autonomy, or independence. These minorities are not primarily defined by distinct culture, language, or set of values, but by a common desire for collective self-government. Uh, multinational uh, federation, again, has been used many a times. Alfred Stepan defines multinational federations as those which have territorially based differences based on language, religion, culture, and identities, and there are significant political groups that would like to build political sovereignties or independent state uh, on the basis of these territorially based differences. Stepan considers Canada, India, Spain, Russia, and Belgium as multinational, but not Switzerland, because there are no significant groups in Switzerland asking for autonomy or independence. Uh, special status and uh, asymmetric federalism has been defined. It is important to remember that demand for special status by national minorities is not just a demand for uh, additional powers, but also for national recognition, a point which was made by Carlos, uh, a symbolic declaration of their distinct identity and uniqueness. Two terms which have not been discussed really, but which I would like to introduce. Uh, one is uh, uh, politics of belonging. Yuval Davis, uh, in fact, gave this concept, and uh, she believes uh, that politics of belonging basically aims at constructing belonging in a particular way to particular collectivities that are at the same time being constructed by these projects in very particular ways. The threat, real or perceived, from the other is what leads to politicization of belonging. People feel secure when the checkpoints and markers language, race, skin color, dress, mannerism, citizenship, is clearly def uh, defined and separates them from the, the familiar and the unfamiliar. Uh, and when this separation is validated as a geographical space where the community of belonging can control the state institutions that manage the borders and checkpoints. Yuval Davis further argues that politics of belonging can be played at two levels. On the one hand, hegemonic political powers propagate the maintenance and reproduction of boundaries of the community of belonging in one particular way. But there is also a contestation and challenge by other political agents. It is important to recognize, however, that such political agents struggle both for the promotion of their specific projects in construction of their uh, collectivity and its boundaries, and at the same time use these ideologies and projects in order to promote their own power position uh, within the, uh, and outside the collectivity. Uh, thus, in the politics of belonging, there can be two narratives, the dominant narrative and a counter-narrative. The counter-narrative inevitably tries to construct a distinct cultural and national identity for its community of belonging, separate from and in opposition to identity of the dominant community. This construction and demand for political rights most notably the right of self-determination, are justified in the name of protecting the identity of the smaller community, national community. Uh, there can be other real or perceived threats, such as that of economic exploitation, deprivation, relative backwardness, that further accentuate these sentiments. Apprehensions about identity and economic concerns can also be elite-mediated constructions to achieve political gains. The emergence of Naga homeland movement can be understood in terms of their attempt to emphasize their distinct identity and their apprehensions about their future in India. Naga hills came under the British rule sometimes in the later half of 19th century. Subsequently, 
the British introduced modern education, introduced Christianity, uh, they created state institutions, uh, and thereby they, and of course modern education was the most potent force which created a sense of uh, nationalism or identity among the Nagas. Uh, during the early uh, part of 20th century, when the national movement was uh, gaining momentum, and when there was a real prospect of uh, some form of uh, uh, representative government coming to India, uh, the educated Nagas became very conscious and aware. Uh, they believed that uh, thrown among 40 crore Indians, 400 million Indians, one crore Nagas, their voice will not be heard. Uh, their representation in the legislative assemblies will be very minimal. Their lands will be taken away. New taxes will be imposed. And this, is, this narrative was built by them. Uh, the Naga leadership often emphasized uh, that in terms of race, ethnicity, language, culture, and religion, they are not part of India. They have never been part of India. And many of the British administrators, like John H. Hutton, or Charles Posey, or the then governor of Assam, Robert Dreed, all of them, initially, they would consider Nagas as savages, head-hunting, indulging in internecine warfare against their neighbors. But uh, now the same British administrators also tried to convince the Nagas and uh, their own government that the Nagas need special protection. And the Nagas really bought this argument about their distinctiveness and the fact that they, they say that the most distinctive feature of their identity is, has been, that they were never part of India. They say that the Ahoms could never conquer us. Even the British who brought us under their control uh, followed a policy of non-interference. Of course, this is a debatable concept. Sajal Nag has uh, uh, adequately uh, shown that how, while formally following a policy of non-interference, the British actually uh, tried to structurally detribalize the tribals of Northeast India by uh, by introducing money economy, trade marts, by establishing institutions of modern governance, state structures, and above all, by, by creating inner line permit, which forbade the foreigners from infringing into Naga hills. And the main concern was not to protect the Nagas, but to protect the British dominions in Assam uh, Valley, where they had started large-scale tea plantations, and the Nagas had this practice of coming down from the hills for salt. The salt uh, springs were there in the foothills. And also to indulge in some barter trade for iron and uh, uh, some other uh, implements. Uh, so the British wanted the Nagas to keep away uh, from the plains. And they had to undertake uh, more than 10 expeditions in the later half of 19th century in order to tame the Nagas and to ensure that they don't come down from the hills. The British, at least technically, formally, followed a policy of non-interference in the Naga uh, uh, issues and matters. The Naga uh, elites tried to argue before the Simon Commission and before the British government, before they left, before they left uh, uh, India, <coughs> that since the Nagas are distinct and unique and were never part of India, they, therefore they should be left alone. Uh, there were many agreements, it was pointed out, nine uh, point agreement, Saragbar Haidari. Uh, again, it goes, I mean, the way certain historical uh, moments are interpreted, the nine point ag agreement, which was, which talked about a 10 year pre period, after which the Naga issue will be decided. The Nagas interpreted it to mean that after 10 years, they will be free to chart their own political uh, uh, future. The government of India believed that it only meant that a new framework will be negotiated uh, about uh, the, the situation of Nagas, the status of Nagas within the Indian Union. There was no agreement on this. It failed. During 1950s, for the next 40 years, there was a very violent conflict between the Naga uh, independentists 
and the government of India. One day before Indian independence, they declared their independence. Uh, they refused to accept the Indian constitution. Uh, they conducted uh, a referendum in May 1950, which according to them, by 99% majority, decided that Nagas will not join the Indian Union. They did not participate in the uh, first two parliamentary elections, but of course, uh, there was a section among the Nagas which wanted to come to some settlement, uh, <laughs> uh, to come to some settlement with the government of India, as a result of which, finally, in 1962, Nagaland was created, 16th uh, constitutional amendment, Nagaland was created as a state within Indian Union. Article 371 and Schedule 6, uh, it basically gives Nagaland more powers than perhaps any state assembly, not just in India, but even in Northeast India, so that the Naga uh, Legislative Assembly, and don't forget, they have almost nearly all the seats are reserved for uh, Naga tribes. 99%, I mean, out of 60, 59 are reserved. Even the one is also for them. So uh, the Naga Assembly can uh, uh, practically veto any legislation by the government uh, uh, union parliament uh, concerning uh, Naga customary law, uh, concerning Ra Naga traditions, uh, their land rights. Uh, the inner line permit has continued. Uh, and uh, there are so many other ways in which the basic concern of the Nagas about they being overwhelmed uh, by the Indians, their lands taken away, new taxes uh, will be uh, uh, imposed on them, that has been taken care of. But despite that, and for the first time in their history, it cannot be denied that Nagaland emerged as a unified uh, political uh, state uh, with a government having exclusive jurisdiction over certain matters. And this was mainly because of the special arrangement that was given to them by government of India. Of course, the matter did not stop there. Uh, it did not satisfy many of the Naga uh, groups. There has been competitive nationalism among the Naga. So despite 1947, despite 1975, uh, despite uh, the Naga ceasefire in 1997, and despite the 2015 agreement about which my two previous speakers talked about, the Naga issue remains. The 2015, in, in fact, many of the original demands that Nagas had, uh, there were two. One was regarding sovereignty, and the other was regarding the integration of Naga areas, the greater Nagaland or Naga Lim. Uh, basically, by 2015 framework agreement, they have given up those two demands, but they would still want a certain recognition of their distinctiveness, and the two sticking points, we are told, are the question of a separate constitution and separate flag. And even on those, initially it was believed that the Union Government, Government of India, is quite amenable uh, to these. The 2015 agreement <laughs> talked about shared sovereignty, and the Nagas, of course, Muiva has more than once emphasized he did it in 2005, he did it in 2020, uh, on the occasion of Naga Independence Day. N sovereignty belongs to the Naga people. They say we have come this much, we cannot go beyond it. We cannot become like any other state. We cannot accept the Indian constitution as it is. You have to recognize our distinctiveness. And any agreement, the 1997 ceasefire ag agreement, Padma Nabhaiya, it was said that any settlement will be based on recognition of uh, Naga's uniqueness. And they define their uniqueness in terms of the fact that they were never part of India. So they say that any settlement, at least, at least give us our own constitution and a flag. And just last point, these shouldn't be uh, such sticking points. I, whether you talked about US, whether you talked about Asha, whether you talked about, uh, talk about Russia, the republics in Russia have their own constitutions. Many people would not accept Russia as a genuine federation or a genuine liberal democracy, but despite that, 
the republics in Russia have their own constitutions, have their own flags. In fact, earlier, the head of the republic, some of the republics, Tatarstan, were called president. They were designated as president. Uh, similarly, in US, you have separate constitutions, separate flags. I don't understand. I can understand because of the abrogation of Article 370. Now it creates a very peculiar situation. Separate flag, I will just mention how the Karnataka Assembly has its own flag. There were issues raised. In fact, some, some scholars argued, why don't you give uh, the Nagas their own flag, but you give separate flag to other states also? The problem is that, last point, the problem is that uh, in asymmetric federations, these national minorities demand that there should be something which only they get, not, I mean, this coffee for everyone approach will not work. You give tea to others, give coffee only to us. So that is the main sticking point. Thank you very much.